Hi, this is Dr. Burton, and I am going to start this paper, An Argument for God from Logos. And I don't know how long this will be, so we'll just gauge it. This paper has a lot of symbols. I use some arguments in symbol form, so I'll have to explain them. But let's start and see what happens. All right, so this is a paper I wrote in 2016, you can see. Uh, I was writing my dissertation on uh, Plato's Theotetus at the time. I was thinking about uh, Plato and Nietzsche, and I think this is the summer where I took the class on Nietzsche and compiled that list of quotes where he rejects reason. Um, I was teaching a logic class, and in that class, we started thinking about reason is ontological, and we went through some iterations of uh, that combination with God. And this is kind of leading me into my study of history. So I noticed that uh, Nietzsche says that reason is not ontological. Reason does not apply to being, and there is no God. So that's kind of where we're at now. That's a dominant view now. Um, reason does not apply to being, and there is no God. In philosophy, that's a dominant view. It's not the only view, but that's not, it's a recent view. If you back up in history, the first phase of history, which is where I start in my book, uh, the ancient philosophers thought reason is ontological, it applies to being, and there is no God. So with these two bookends, two bookends, we have reason is ontological, and there's no God. Now we have reason is not ontological, and there's no God. But in between, we have two other views. The second phase, which I think starts with John's gospel, is that reason is ontological and God, the theistic God, exists. Okay, so that's John's gospel, what I talked about last time. What comes after is another phase, and it's kind of a transition phase into Nietzsche's view. And that is the view that reason is not ontological, reason does not apply to being, and there is a God. And so this is uh, promoted by William of Ockham and some other nominalists. So they think that we can't know universals, we could know particulars. And so the Logos is not in the world, and probably the Logos is not in our mind either. We can only know God through his revelation, through scripture, not through his revelation and creation, through scripture. Um, so this, after time begins to be eroded that we could know God at all becomes eroded so you have these shifts reason is ontological and there is no theistic God reason is ontological and there is a theistic God reason is not ontological and there is a theistic God and this final phase reason is not ontological and there is no theistic God that's Nietzsche's view and I suppose, propose, argue that he ushers in the new philosophers of the future, as he calls them, and these include the postmodern philosophers, the analytic philosophers, and the critical theorists. And I trace these roots in my book. Now, today I want to deal with the two views um, the the bookends the not not really the bookends the uh john's gospel god, reason is ontological and god exists and nietzsche reason is not ontological and god does not exist so we're going to get into this conversation through this paper an argument for god from logos and when i say logos i'm talking about what we discussed in that last video where we gave a definition of Logos and we gave a fullness of the Logos from the Gospel of John. All right, so let's read through this together. Nietzsche intuitively sees a connection between reason, God, and the rules of language when he exclaims, quote, reason in language. Oh, what an old deceptive female she is. I am afraid we are not rid of God because we still have faith in grammar. Isn't that a fascinating quote. I really thought about this quote a lot and 
I'll just keep reading. The argument of this paper is inspired by and is in response to Nietzsche's intuition and his rejection of reason as ontological. And we're going to call that RO. Reason as ontological means reason applies to being. That reason is the laws of thinking as well as the laws of being. Now, if you're new to my YouTube channel and you're wondering what do I mean by reason, I have a 15-part podcast series called Retrieving Reason where I define this. In this section, I'm talking about the laws of thought. Reason, the laws of thinking, is also the laws of being. Um, okay. Now, I have a footnote here. For analysis of Nietzsche's rejection of reason as ontological, see my paper, Logos and Anti-Logos Epistemology After Nietzsche. That became a chapter of my book, so you could just read chapter three in my book. Nietzsche's philosophical starting point is empiricism in epistemology, coupled with a radical materialist flux doctrine in metaphysics. He's going back to Heraclitus's view, except he's a little more radical, I, I would say. So empiricism is the view that all of our knowledge is through the senses. All that we can know is what we can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch. And this radical materialist flux doctrine says that all matter is constantly in motion and is changing. So we can't really know anything. This leads to deep skepticism. He begins with the claim that the world of appearance is constantly changing, nothing is fixed, therefore there is no fixed being about which we may have knowledge. In addition, the world of appearance is the only world. There is no Platonic or Kantian thing in itself existing beyond the world of appearance. Nietzsche's epistemological assumptions, bundled with his radical flux materialism, leads to a tragic skepticism. Now, that's not my judgment. That comes from Matthew Meyer's book, Reading Nietzsche Through the Ancients, and he talks about this tragic worldview. Um... I do not work on Nietzsche's uh, worldview in the positive in my book. I look at uh, his skepticism and rejection of reason. Now, he is going to reject that reason is ontological. But why should we go the way he went? What if Nietzsche had not started with empiricism in the Flux Doctrine? What if he had paused to reflect upon the nature of perception? What if he paused to recognize the element of interpretation in the process of perception? Now, this is something that the postmodern philosophers call us to do. Recognize that we don't experience reality directly. We experience data and we interpret. And we interpret in light of, of a lot of things, in light of our basic beliefs, in light of our values. And so uh, what, if, what if Nietzsche has, had paused and, and recognized the element of interpretation? What if he wrestled with the nature of reason prior to his rejection and lifelong assault on reason? Did he define reason as the laws of thought? Actually, I think he did. I think he did. If you read his essay on truth in a non-moral sense. But if he had thought more about his views and if he had thought more about Aristotle's chapter four in the metaphysics where Aristotle talks about the connection between the laws of thought and the laws of being, perhaps things would have turned out differently for him. My contention is that Nietzsche went mad because he gave up on reason. It wasn't merely some uh, syphilis or mental illness. He uh, gave up reason and gave up meaning. And because we need meaning, he couldn't live that way. He wanted to have integrity, but he couldn't because you, the light shines in the darkness. You cannot overcome the light of reason. All right, this paper is an exploration of the alternative argument that Nietzsche could have given. Reason in language. Oh, what a beautiful expression of the fit between thinking and being through logos. That's my proposed alternative quote. This paper is an exploration of an alternative starting point and consequently an alternative conclusion to that of Nietzsche's regarding reason and being. What happens if we begin with reason, the laws of thought, prior to the senses? 
What are the implications for being if we begin with reason? Are we led to some non-material reality? Now, I want to pause and get a book out really quick. All right, I got the book out. It is The Last Word by Thomas Nagel. I just remembered a quote from this book. He is trying to uh, figure out how to ground reason in a naturalist evolutionary uh, sense, and he can't do it. And so I'm going to read a little bit from this book. Um, he, he thinks this is alarming. He's led to rationalism, and, and he thinks this is alarming. Um, he says, I call this view alarming because it is hard to know what world picture to associate it with and difficult to avoid the suspicion that the picture will be religious or quasi-religious. Rationalism has always had a more religious flavor than empiricism. Even without God, the idea of a natural sympathy between the deepest truths of nature and the deepest layers of the human mind, which can be exploited to allow gradual development of a truer and truer conception of reality, makes us more at home in the universe than is secularly comfortable. Now he goes on a little bit further down this page, and he says, um, I don't want there to be something like this. He, he fears religion. I speak from experience, being strongly subject to this fear myself. I want atheism to be true and am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. My guess is that the cosmic authority problem is not a rare condition and that it is responsible for much of the scientism and reductionism of our time. And then he goes on to talk about how you really can't ground these ideas of reason, the laws of thought, in the materialist picture. So again, the last word by Thomas Nagel, and he is exploring the implications of reason for non-materialist, non-material reality. So materialists have had a lot of problems grounding reason in being. Okay, so now let's go on again with my paper. The more ambitious hope of the paper is that there would be a renewed interest in the possibility of a, of a rationalist alternative to the dead end of contemporary skepticism resulting from several hundred years of empiricism in the Western philosophical tradition. And my, my book is an argument against empiricism and materialism. By reviving a discussion of reason, especially of reason as ontological, the hope is that we may engage in a revived discussion of metaphysics on the basis of a more firm foundation than in previous philosophical eras. If reason is ontological and reason applies to being, then being is knowable to reason. Where the enlightened philosophers challenged us to dare to reason, that's what Kant said, post-enlightenment philosophers sought to deconstruct reason because of failings in the enlightenment conception of reason. And the more I study these failings, the more I, I tend to think there, there is something to the uh, deconstructionist and postmodern critique of reason. The argument of this paper has the effect of serving as a critique of the post-enlightenment anti-reason with a new challenge to dare to reason again. A re-evaluation of the revaluation of reason is necessary if we are to avoid the silencing of all significant speech. Um, by significant speech is meant that words signify things or beings, that words are not just about other words. And I have written about this again in my book. Uh, there's a section where I analyze Aristotle's Metaphysics Chapter 4 where he talks about words can't be only about other words in an infinite regress because then we don't ever talk about anything. Words are about things. Nietzsche thinks that he is starting with a self-evident truth when he says that the senses deliver a world of changing appearances and this world is all there is. Is that self-evident? I mean, it, 
may be evident to the senses that the world is changing, is it self-evident that this world is all that there is? How is that self-evident? Many, many people have doubted that. Many religions have doubted that. Nietzsche is right to begin with what is self-evident. In principle, that's a good place to start. Only, it is doubtful that the changing world of appearances is self-evident and that this is the only reality. Rather than starting with the experience of the external world, we will begin with experience of reflecting upon the world of appearances. If I start with the most fundamental feature of experience, it is that of an internal reality reflecting upon an apparent external reality, the world. When I reflect upon my experience of appearances, the first thing I notice is that I identify and distinguish A from non-A, self and non-self. My first conscious experience of anything, self or otherwise, is that of reason applied to being. I am a being and I perceive the world to be a being other than myself, though I could be mistaken. But to even think it could be non-being or a mistake or an illusion is to apply reason to appearance. Is what appears A? Is it or is it non-A? Whatever I think, I cannot escape the laws of thought as applied to being. So we begin the argument with the reality of thinking and not that of empirical experience, because experience assumes thinking. Nietzsche's era was an assuming experience is prior to thinking. On the contrary, thinking is prior to experience. When I begin reflecting upon experience, I am aware of an inner reality, the reflecting self, and an external reality, the world of experience or appearances. This awareness of the distinction between inner reality and external reality, reality, be it real or not, is the first application of the law of identity, or what I call LI. I continue to reflect, and I think either I am or I am not. This is an, this is an application of the law of excluded middle, or what I call LEM. The world of appearance is, or the world of appearance is not. So we have law of excluded middle. Yet, it cannot be the case that the world of experience is bo both is and is not in the same respect and at the same time by the law of non-contradiction. So you can see we're deriving the laws of thought by thinking about being. Thinking about anything requires the laws of thought. The laws of thought assume being. The self as thinker minimally is being. And the cause of what I see, if it is other than the self, is also being. The laws of thought are the laws of being and is what will be named reason is ontological. The laws of thought are self-evident. They cannot be doubted. And if you doubt them, you're using them. So they cannot be doubted without being assumed. Therefore, the laws of thought are in an indubitable starting point for all thinking. Someone once asked me, what are your axioms? This is my axiom, the laws of thought. The laws of thought are the laws of being, and as such are the indubitable starting point for existing things. So the laws of thought cannot be doubted, and the laws of thought apply to being whatever being there is. Reason as ontological says that some things cannot be. Some states of affairs are ontologically impossible such as a square circle or being from non-being. Reason is ontological, is foundational for reasoning and for reasoning about being. Yet, if reason is ontological, some views of reality are false. Why? Because they do not correspond to reality. Because they affirm that reason is not ontological. By views of reality is meant basic beliefs that make claims about the nature of ultimate reality. And then some of these views are material monism, dualism, idealism, and theism. So we'll go through some of those as I go through my argument. The ambitious argument of this paper is either reason is ontological and God exists and words have significant meaning, or reason is not ontological and God does not exist 
and words do not have significant meaning, and one ought to be silent. It is not the case that reason is not ontological, that is, reason is ontological, and God does not exist, that is, God does exist, therefore reason is ontological, God exists, and words have significant meaning. Now I have to argue for that, right? Um, Because my critics will come in and say, oh, she's assuming God. No, the proof is for God from this idea that uh, reason is ontological. Now, let's see. Perhaps I should pause here and go through the argument in the next video to make you wait. Again, I would like to invite you to come to my Locals community, kellyburton.locals.com, and join the conversation. You can ask me questions there. Um, We talked about the beginning of my argument for God from Logos today. Next, we're going to just go through the steps. Let me give you a preview. You're going to see these arguments like this, and they're going to go through the whole paper. I have 15 arguments. Here's a preview. All right, I'm not going to give you the whole thing because it's like giving gold away. All right, next time we'll start with argument one. Thank you for listening.